Um, so I was just thanking the organizers both of the, uh, of the conference um, and the trimester. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, an application of um, model theory of differentially closed fields to algebra, which um, started four or five years ago. And uh, by now, there's sort of a small body of work um, on the subject. And I want to report on what's been done and, and what, what the state of this uh, um, area is. Um, and I took the liberty to write down the references, the papers that I'll be talking about. Um, I'm <coughs> sorry this is not in alphabetical order, but in order to draw this nice Venn diagram, I think it was important to switch things around. Um, so um, <coughs> uh, I'll, I'll mention all of these, uh, uh, these papers. Um, and these are, this is sort of the sum total of what uh, has been done on the subject. Though speaking last night at the cocktail, dinner with uh, Omar, it sounds like he's, uh, who you might notice is the unique intersection point of uh, these sets of authors, um, that he has uh, made some further progress I won't talk about um, that doesn't appear, uh, appear here. Uh, so let me start by um, stating the, uh, um, uh, the problem, the algebraic problem. So this is the dixnier merglin <coughs> equivalence. So this is a problem in, uh, in uh, non-commutative algebra. And despite being involved for several years now, I still don't consider myself a, an expert. Um, but here's what the problem says. It's not, it, uh, the, the issues are relatively easy to describe. Uh, so you, have, you start with a field, uh, for which for um, convenience, I'll assume, is algebraically closed, <coughs> characteristic 0. And you have an algebra over the field finally generated um, the Tyrian K-algebra, um, so not necessarily commutative. It's a K-algebra, so uh, the field is a regular commutative field, and the field commutes with all the elements in the algebra. It's in the center of the algebra. Um, <coughs> and, and the work of uh, Dixmier and Merglin in the 70s um, in, in representation theory of certain class of algebras that they were studying um, led to considering the following notions. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry? The, uh, the, uh, ah, yes. Uh, Notarian means left Notarian. Yeah. Um, <coughs> but uh, when I say ideal, it means two-sided ideal and so on. Um, <coughs> so... Uh, um, this is about uh, prime ideals in this algebra, two-sided ideals prime in the, in the general ring theoretic sense. Um, <coughs> and uh, um, uh, various notions appeared. One of them is um, uh, rationality. So um, P is called rational if the center of... Uh, the ring of quotients of A mod P is just K. So <coughs> we're in a non-commutative ring. Um, so A mod P is not an integral domain, but it's a, it's a prime ring. And um, the theorem of Goldie, that in that context, you can invert all the regular elements. And you get something, which I'm writing as frac, the ring of quotients. It's not a field, but it's, a, uh, it's simple Artinian K algebra. So it's a matrix algebra over a division ring. And so its center will be the center of that division ring. So the center will be a field. So the center of this ring of quotients will be a field, and it certainly extends k. Everything commutes with k. And the, the, the ideal, the prime ideal, is called rational if there's nothing new in the center. The center is just the field k. In the case when k is not algebraically closed, you ask that this is an algebraic extension of k, an algebraic field, finite, finite extension of the field k. <coughs> um, um, Another notion for P is um, it being primitive, and this is in the usual, uh, more, maybe more familiar sense, um, of annihilating uh, a simple uh, A module, left A module. And the third, the third notion is being locally closed. So this is in the Zariski topology. Um, 
on uh, SPAC A, which makes sense even in the non-commutative case, but we can say it uh, explicitly by saying that if you take, uh, right, so maybe I can lift this a little bit. Uh, if you look at the intersection um, over all um, prime ideals Q, where Q properly extends P prime, sorry, now he's here, um, <coughs> prime, uh, <coughs> then uh, this is not P. So if you look at the proper prime ideal extending Q uh, and intersect all of them, you don't get P, you get something bigger. So if you took something in here that's not in here and localized, then the singleton P would be locally closed in that open set. <clears throat> so that's, that's the, the condition of being locally closed. Okay, so as I say, this, is, this comes out of um, work of Dixme and Miglin in the 70s, and they were looking at a certain class of algebras, um, uh, enveloping algebras of, of uh, Lie, Lie algebras, and um, <clears throat> um, uh, coming out of their work uh, is that in that class of algebras, these, are, these three notions on the prime ideal are equivalent. If you think about the commutative case, um, these are different ways of characterizing P being maximal. In the non-commutative case, these notions, these ways of describing maximality diverge. Um, <coughs> so the, uh, um, right. Um, so we say uh, that A satisfies uh, the dixme miglin equivalence, the DME. Um, if these all agree for all p, for all prime ideals p in the ideal. Um, <coughs> so as I said, it's, uh, it's established, uh, the ME is established in the 70s um, for many classes, and, and since then, in a lot of work since then, uh, for many classes of algebras. I'm not listing, I'm not giving a, uh, uh, <clears throat> in any way, a complete history. There are lot, lots of people involved in this um, uh, for, for many years, looking at different classes of algebras coming up from different contexts. Um, <coughs> um, also, so I'm listing here just a few things uh, that are known. In general, it's known, again, coming out of Dixby and Miglin's work, that if you take, that, the that, that some of these conditions locally closed uh, implies uh, primitive, implies rational, always. So really this is a question about rationality implying locally closedness. Are all rational prime ideals locally closed? Uh, but it's not true in general. So there are counterexamples already in the 70s uh, by Irving Lorentz. So this is not something you expect to be equivalent all the time. And the question becomes, most of the work becomes sort of twofold, you either restrict to certain classes of algebras or analogies. You look at anal uh, um, other, other contexts where there's an analogy um, <coughs> and you ask some version of the Dixme and Migli equivalence in the other analogy. So using model theory, um, so using the model theory of differentially closed fields, um, we make some contributions. to uh, this kind of question, problem. Um, so maybe I list them. There's supposed to be a colon there. Um, <coughs> so let me just, as an overview, list uh, several aspects of the issue to, to which work this model theoretic application has um, happened. I won't, I won't be giving any details now, and then I'll go back and give some details for, for certain parts of it. So what, what kind of things can we do? using model theory, well, first of all, we produce um, the first um, finite dimensional. So the dimension here is uh, Gelfand Kirillov dimensional counterexamples. So uh, <coughs> Gelfand Kirillov dimension is um, the non-commutative analog of cruel dimension. And unlike in the commutative case, it doesn't follow from finally generated. You don't, you don't, it's, it's not necessarily fine dimensional. In fact, the counterexamples that were produced by Irving and Lorentz and all counterexamples until, until now uh, had infinite GK dimension. So I'm not giving the definition of GK dimension because when I talk, when I give details about this, I'm just producing an example and it'll be a particular example. This, 
sort of very clearly finite dimensional. And so <coughs> I think I can, um, I can avoid giving the formal definition of this dimension. But that's something that comes out of this work. Um, <coughs> second theme is to restrict, um, uh, so prove DME for um, uh, so a special class um, of algebras, um, which are Hopf uh, or uh, extensions. And I will give this definition later and explain them. They're a very particular construction, um, but they're somehow a common way of producing non-commutative um, algebras from, from commutative information. And, uh, and for this collection of algebras, uh, the work implies that the DME is true for them. In general, it's conjectured uh, um, for all um, for all Hopf algebras of finite GK dimension. <coughs> so this work can be viewed as kind of evidence towards this conjecture. Um, I'm not even going to define Hopf structure in general in an algebra, uh, though may maybe lots of people don't know about Hopf algebras. Uh, you have a co-product. Um, <coughs> But uh, let me at least, it might be useful later to just recall, at least in the commutative case, so in, we won't be interested in the commutative case, but let me recall that when A is commutative, so if A is commutative, then Hopf um, is the same as saying that A is the coordinate ring of an algebraic group, an affine algebraic group. So in the, uh, in the commutative case, we're talking about um, coordinate rings of, of algebraic groups, affine algebraic groups. In the non-commutative case, well, the usual thing in non-commutative algebra is you kind of imagine that your algebra is an algebra of functions of some imaginary geometric object and uh, non, non-commutative geometry. You don't have something on the geometric side, you just have the algebra. And so a Hopf structure on such an algebra should be viewed as being the functions on some imaginary group structure on the imaginary uh, uh, geometric structure. So it's, uh, it's the extension of uh, study of algebraic groups to, uh, to a non-commutative setting, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, and uh, third theme is an analog. So a uh, commutative uh, Poisson analog of DME um, <coughs> was asked for. Yes, I don't know that it was conjectured um, <coughs> by Brown and Gordon around 2003. Um, <coughs> so this is an analogy. This is actually in the commutative algebraic setting, but you have a Poisson bracket. And so there's this, there's, it's not uncommon that there's a trade off between non commutativity and additional structure. So, um, so here you have a, an algebra with a Poisson bracket, and you have to take an, an analogous statement. So you look at Poisson ideals, and you have natural um, analogs of those three notions, and you ask if they're equivalent in this commutative setting. And they, they, they actually are, uh, can be obtained by some uh, um, standard process called semi-classical limit from non-commutative things. Um, <coughs> and so this is refuted. Yeah, so by the way, this A was done in... Uh, this paper one, and this was done in paper two. Um, so this is refuted. One by a counterexample related to the counterexample from part A there, um, uh, but a weaker version was established. <coughs> Um, in that same paper, essentially by weakening locally closed, so there are things that are rational, not locally closed in this Poisson context, to looking at not all primes, but, but co-dimension one, height one primes. Um, <coughs> and then the statement is true, and this involved some model theory as well. Um, and also in this Poisson an analog, um, it's the, the, the full form, the full, the strong, not this weaker version, but the strong version uh, is proved. Uh, for <coughs> um, the Hopf case. So the analog of this conjecture that in, in the, for Hopf algebras the DMA should be true um, is proved in the Poisson analog. 
except with this additional assumption that the hop structure is co-commutative. So all, everything on this part C is commutative, but you ask that the Hopf structure is co-commutative, so the algebraic group is abelian. And in that case, this was, uh, the DME is, uh, is established, uh, and that's in paper four. Uh, and then the final um, uh, class of things uh, connected to this is, uh, well, let me just say an abstract model theoretic resolution. Now uh, that's maybe um, exaggeration to call it resolution, maybe formulation. Um, and it may also be an exaggeration to call this a, a, uh, <coughs> a contribution to the original DME problem. I mean, the algebraic certainly wouldn't recognize this. But the whole thing can be put in some abstract multi setting, and, and, and there's some work there. And this happens in, ah, maybe I mislabeled this. Four, no, this was done in three. This is done in four. Omar and I. Okay, uh, so I'm going to talk about A, B, and D, hopefully. Um, I'm going to skip C entirely, even though about half the work in this stuff is, is the Poisson, community Poisson case. But I, yeah, so I initially thought I would give an overview of all, uh, of all the things that have been done, but it's not possible. So I've just, I'm not going to say anything more about C, so I won't work in this Poisson context. I'll just talk about the counterexample, the Hopf case, and hopefully also the algebraic geometry case. So <coughs> let's get started. So how? Uh, does model theory apply? Um, so I'm working, this is the model theory of DCF0, so I work in uh, some saturated model, and we take, um, aha, so I let k delta be the, uh, the constants, and I take some parameters, <coughs> some uh, parameter field k, let me assume Again, that k is algebraically closed for convenience. So it's a, it's a, it's a constant. My base field is living in the constants. So the little de derivative acts trivially on the constants, uh, on, on little k. Um, <coughs> and we start with a type, um, p, which is finite dimensional. So what do I mean by this? I just mean, i.e., um, if you take a realization of the type, then the uh, transcendence degree um, over k of the differential field generated by A uh, is finite. Okay, so there's a finite dimensional type. Um, then we know up to uh, interdefinability that P is the generic type of a D variety. So this is exactly the D varieties uh, that Remy was talking about yesterday. Um, <coughs> so um, just to recall, so I have an affine um, algebraic variety over K, um, say irreducible. So no smoothness assumptions. Remy sometimes assumed smoothness. Um, just some affine irreducible algebraic variety, and you have a vector, now an algebraic vector field on V, which I'll think of as a section, um, a regular section to the tangent bundle. There's a polynomial map to the tangent bundle. To every point V, it associates a tangent vector to that point, but in a polynomial, in an algebraic way. Um, and then we have notions of D subvarieties. That's what Remy called invariant subvarieties. So W in V is a D subvariety. Uh, means that, that if you restrict um, S to W, then the section <coughs> goes into the tangent bundle of W. So it's invariant for this vector field. And you have a notion of demorphism and de-rational map, and ca this category of D varieties that we saw some of in, in, uh, in Remy's talk. Um, <coughs> so what's the connection between P and, uh, uh, and um, this D variety, P, is uh, the generic type of, of what I'll call VS sharp K. K is my monster model here. So this is the set of all points, the all K points of V, where the section agrees with the differential section. So the derivative applied coordinate wise is also a section to the tangent bundle. And you ask where they coincide. So this is a system of order one differential polynomial equations saying, that the derivative is equal to some polynomial in A. 
Uh, and this is a Colchin closed set. So it's, it's defined by a system of differential polynomial equations in our model, in our monster model. And um, <coughs> P is a generic type. Generic here, I mean Colchin generic. So the type P says that I'm in here, but if I take any property subvariety, then I'm not in WS sharp of K. So what we're used to for, say, in Zariski, the context of algebraic geometry. So it's generic in that, uh, that sense, but for differential polynomial equations. Okay. Um, Sorry? Type is finite yeah, type is just finite more ionic, right. Uh, it is one derivation case. It's the same to say it's a finite marker. I'm working just with one derivation. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, right. So from this finite rank type, we get this uh, D variety. From the D variety, we get a, a coordinate ring. So let R be just a coordinate ring. Then S induces a derivation a k-linear derivation on R. Just what it means to have a section to the tangent bundle. You get induced on the coordinate ring a derivation. Uh, and so we may as well take our delta to be a delta subring of our model, working in a saturated model. So we have a differential ring cooked up from our type. And now given this, this is of course a commutative differential ring, we now get finally our, our uh, non-commutative object A, and this is going to be its OR extension. <coughs> so this is a non-commutative polynomial ring, sometimes called a twisted polynomial ring. Um, the elements can be written as polynomials uniquely with, with coefficients on the left, but when you multiply, you might sometimes have to multiply x with a coefficient on the right, and then it's not equal to Rx, it's equal to Rx plus the derivative of R. And this gives us a non-commutative uh, analog of a polynomial ring. So R is commutative, but A is now not commutative. And so I, I'll just say, without even defining it, uh, we never define the dimension. But I hope it's not controversial to say that this is the cruel dimension <coughs> of R plus 1. It's just a polynomial ring in one variable. Uh, it's non-commutative, but it doesn't uh, increase this natural notion of dimension more than you might expect. So this is a finite dimensional algebra, and our counterexample will be such an A. And so there's this tight connection um, between these things. And so <coughs> you can see now how model theory might, uh, might intervene. Um, you'll have properties on the type P, and that'll give you properties of this algebra A. And, uh, and, um, <coughs> and so we can say things about this non commutative setting. And the, the, these connections actually not uh, um, uh, on the monotheoretic side is, uh, is very well known. Uh, I mean, the properties of P that we will need. Maybe it's worth making a chart. Um, uh, so I have, uh, uh, maybe I can fit it in here. So finite, finite dimensional type P. Uh, I have a D variety that I got from it. Let's, we called it Vs. So P was the generic type of Vs sharp K. And then we got a, a coordinate ring, which is a differential ring, R delta. <coughs> and then we have the OR extension, which is this twisted polynomial ring, A. And there's a sort of a complete dictionary between these, uh, between these things. Uh, and I'm not going to give the proofs. I mean, so, sometimes you have to work a little bit. Sometimes it's, uh, it's clear. But I'll state what, uh, uh, what, what um, we're interested here. So, for example, if the type is non-isolated, non-isolated, um, <coughs> um, which is what property we'll be interested in on the type, then what does that say? Well, um, geometrically, it's pretty clear. It, 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 um, remember, this is a generic type, so it says that the that the property subvarieties are dense in V, because if they weren't, you would take the Zariski closure, Zariski dense. Zariski dense. In phi, if they weren't, you take the Zariski closure, that would again be a D sub variety and be a proper one. Um, and, uh, and now your type just has to say that you omit this one. And so you isolated the type. Okay? So if it's not isolated, then, then there are many D sub varieties. 
You have to say, you have to give infinitely many amount of information to say that you're generic. Union of all property sub-varieties. I didn't say union, but I said the property sub-varieties are dense. Uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, the union. The union of all property sub-varieties is, uh, its risky closure is again a proper sub-variety, property sub-variety. The geometric um, statement of this, well, these are given by, by um, delta ideals. So I just look at all prime ideals in R that are delta ideals. I want proper subvarieties, so I want p not to be zero, and I intersect all these. And to say that it's risky, the union is risky dense is just to say that this intersection is zero. And now maybe it's not a stretch to look at this and look at the statement of ah, which you can't, you can't look at it because it's erased of rationality. Uh, rationality said, look at the intersection of all the primes in Q. Um, so my claim is that this is equivalent to saying that this is not rational. So there's some work to do this in both directions, but but not too much. So not being rational meant that if you take, sorry, what's that? Ah, yeah, sorry, yeah, if it was up, then I would not have, uh, yeah, thank you, it's not locally closed. To be locally closed meant that the intersection, for zero to be locally closed, meant that the intersection of all the non-zero primes in A should not be zero. Um, and if you look at the left ideal that P generates in A, P is in R, but if you look at the ideal it generates in A, using the fact that it's a delta ideal, you can prove that that's a prime uh, two-sided um, ideal uh, in A, and so the intersection of those will be zero already, and so the intersection of all of them will be zero. So it's a little bit of work to do to see that this translation happens. Um, the other property is um, P weakly orthogonal to the constants. <coughs> so this means that uh, if I take A realizing P, then A is independent from the constants over little k. So if you don't pass to additional parameters, if you just work over little k, then a is independent from any constant, any finite set of constants. So it's weakly orthogonal. Orthogonal would mean this is true even after you take a non-forking extension. So I'm not asking that. I'm just asking that p be weakly orthogonal. And it's well known what this means geometrically. Uh, I came up in Remy's talk. This means that there are no, there do not exist uh, d-rational maps uh, f from your d-variety to the trivial d-variety. The, the trivial one, which is A1 with the zero vector field uh, over K, right. We find over K, uh, except, except K, of course, except constants, except constant ones. <coughs> That's what it means to be weakly orthogonal, stated geometrically. Algebraically, of course, these d-rational maps, they just are elements of the fraction field of the of the coordinate ring. So this is the same as saying that if you take the coordinate ring and you look at its fraction field, that what would it mean to be a d-rational map? It would have to be a constant with respect to the derivation. So derivation extends uniquely to the fraction field. You can look at the constants and it's saying that the only things you get are little k. Okay, so there are no new constants in the fraction field of R. You, it's just little k. And then again, I, I, without proof, say that this is the same as saying that zero is rational. So this involves looking at studying the center of the ring of quotients of this particular algebra and seeing that, that you, in fact, do boil down to looking at things in the coefficient ring. If you're in the center, uh, say if you were just in the center of this, you'd have to be in R. But then from the rule of how you multiply, uh, you know, a, a little r is in the center, it has to be a constant. And so the, the, the center is going to be um, inside here. There's something to do because you have to go, you have to pass to the Goldie ring of quotients, but not much. So these are actually all equivalences. Okay. Uh, and so now we're, we're done, right? We need to, uh, we're done with this, uh, to finding a counterexample because um, uh, um, uh, because to find, we wanted to find something counterexample. I, I claim that we could find an A which failed the DME, so zero should be rational, but it should not be locally closed. So just looking at that dictionary, I need a type which is, and I'll just state that for now as a fact. We'll come back to this example, hopefully, and I'll give more details, but uh, using Manning kernels, there exist types. There exist 
finite dimensional, finite rank types uh, P over the constants <coughs> um, that are weakly orthogonal, sorry, uh, that are weakly orthogonal um, to K delta, um, but, uh, um, but not isolated. And so as a corollary, we get the theorem. This is what happens. This is part of what we do in theorem one, that some uh, uh, or extensions are x delta fail the DME. Exactly. So there's something a little bit to do. But uh, and I'll, 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 I'll come back to that example later. <clears throat> so yeah, we just get something that satisfies those two properties, so it's rational but not locally closed. And, uh, and so the DME is failed even just for the zero ideal in this, uh, in this ring. So it, okay, um, somehow it's very, it's very much on the surface, but um, well, this one isn't, right? So the whole theory of Mannion kernels and so on is something that uh, the non-commutative algebraists, the representation theorists, don't know, didn't know, um, <clears throat> nor did they know that it could apply in this way, and so one gets a, one gets a finite uh, GK dimension counterexample. Okay, but you can also get positive things um, from this, uh, at least about such uh, A's, from this dictionary. You can work also to prove positive results this way. And so let me state the second theorem. So this is what happens in two. <coughs> and let me just say uh, the DME holds for um, Hopf or extensions. <coughs> so my A is this. So R is a commutative um, differential ring, and I produce the, uh, look at the hop for extensions, and you look at the class of all hop for extensions, so you range over all finely generated um, commutative differential algebras and look at the or extensions you produce, and in that class of algebras, the DME does hold. And let me give uh, I guess e even calling it an outline is too much, a few of the ingredients. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, I haven't defined what Hopf means. So I don't look at R extension like a Hopf for it. So, so what Hopf means is simply that there is a Hopf algebra structure on A, which extends some Hopf algebra structure on R. So uh, we get a Hopf <coughs> algebra structure on R. Which, as I told you before, now I'm in the commutative world, this just means that R was actually the coordinate ring of some affine algebraic group. And of course, I have this section from G to the tangent bundle coming from the fact that this is a differential ring, so it comes from a D variety. And so the, the question, of course, is how is it compatible? How is this group structure compatible with S? So in fact, it's not true. What you'd hope is that somehow the hop structure um, here um, would force this to be a group homomorphism, and you'd have a D group. But it's not true. So it's not necessarily true. So not the case, not necessarily the case that, uh, that S is a group homomorphism. If it was, that's what we call a D group, as we saw <coughs> in Remy's talk. Um, but we don't have uh, here a... Uh, um, a D group, um, and that, that causes some complication. Um, <coughs> but for the purposes of this outline, let me assume we do. So that's, of course, one possibility. So what happens in practice is that there's a certain twisting from a group-like element in, uh, in the ring R. So, so homorphism from G to the multiplicative group that, that, uh, that this is almost a group homorphism, but there's, there's a factor by some um, homomorphism from G to GM. So let's just assume, so let's... Uh, um, so assume it is. Uh, so this is a big assumption. M much of the work is dealing, well, not much, but a significant amount of the work is, uh, is dealing with uh, the general case. But assume it is. So I have a D group now. And so P is generic um, in the definable group. G, which is GS sharp. K, so I now have a definable group, which is something I don't have in general. Um, <coughs> uh, and this is a definable group over the constants. And, 
And now it's a fact that uh, any definable group over the constants um, is analyzable in the constants. In fact, in, uh, in at most three steps. So you have this, um, this situation. Uh, you have the center, and then you have the, uh, the uh, constant points of the center. And if you look, so this is living in the constants. If you look at this quotient using the theory of the logarithmic derivative, you can see that this is a finite dimensional vector space over the constant, so it's internal to the constants. And this fraction is known, theorem of Buyum and then kowalski pillay that G mod at center is internal to the constants. Um, <coughs> so, so what I mean by this, I haven't defined analyzable formally, but I think a lot of people already know it's come up with, I think, I think it's already come up once. But I just mean that you have this sort of uh, vibration, and at each step you're internal to the constants. Over some additional parameters, this quotient is definably isomorphic to something living just in the constants as is the next step. So it's not already internal, but it's stepwise internal. So this means that, um, that P is K-delta analyzable. And then one can prove in general that, if, um, that this implies that if you have a delta analyzable type, uh, yeah, so for such, P weakly orthogonal to the constants implies um, P isolated. So for types which are um, analyzable in the constants, you can never have an example like this. And the idea is, well, think of, let's just do the internal case. You just have to iterate. If, if a type was internal to the constants, then one way to see this is using the binding group. So we know there is a, a definable binding group, Galois action, on the solutions to P. And uh, the being weakly orthogonal to the constants means that that binding group acts transitively. And so P is an orbit. So the set of solutions to P is a and the group is definable. It's a definable group acting on this, on this type definable set, but acting transitively. So that type definable set is actually a definable set. So it's an isolated type. Right? And uh, you can extend that to the analyzable case. And so, uh, and now use the dictionary. And you're done. So um, weak orthogonal actually implies isolated, so rational implies locally closed. Cheating in various ways here, but the last step I'm cheating because that's only for the prime zero you need to do for other primes. Of course, you can look modulo the other prime, but then you're not really in an OR extension. You're in a quotient of an OR extension, but you can handle this as well. Um, <coughs> okay, maybe that was uh, a bit rushed, but I wanted to get to the... Uh, the abstract model theoretic setting, but we get this. I should also say, maybe I'll just say verbally, we actually prove um, a significantly um, more general s setting where we have hop four extensions um, that, are, that where delta is not a derivation, but a sigma derivation. So there's some automorphism of R and delta is a derivation, but twisted by the automorphism. And there's also a notion of hop four where you, maybe I just write it here, where the rule is X times R is sigma of R times X plus delta of R. And in that case, too, we can prove um, uh, the DME for such or extensions. And this, proves, this, this produces a, a, a sort of a, a reasonable class, a reasonably large class of Hopf algebras in which to test the conjecture and, and it tests positively here. In fact, you get a much better class if you could iterate this. So this is a sense in which those are, those are dense in the Hopf algebras. Uh, if you iterate, but we can't really iterate. We really have to start with something commutative. We do one step. Now, if you take a, a, a skew thing, a, 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 a twisted polynomial ring over this, then the coefficient ring is no longer commutative and we're, we're somehow not able to extend this to iterated ones. But that would sort of be the, 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 next, the next thing. Uh, well, that, that's the open question, at least on in this, on this front. Okay, um, right, I have uh, some time. Um, are there any questions? So I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the abstract model theoretic <coughs> formulation. So let me talk a bit about the example of weakly orthogonal but non-isolated. So what did that example look like? It came from a Mannin kernel, but it couldn't be a Mannin kernel because the Mannin kernels are over, over non-constant parameters. So it's a type of something where A is a pair, GT, where, where T, the derivative of T is 1, and it's transcendental. Uh, so T is the generic of the equation delta x equals 1. And G is 
uh, generic element, generic of a Mannian kernel over k of t. And so, um, <coughs> So um, I won't say much, maybe just verbally. I mean, um, so if you take any simple abelian variety over k of t, and um, that does not dis descend, uh, that should be a little k. That should be a little k of t, right? I'm working over the base. Capital K was the, was the model. Um, <coughs> if you take a thing over a little k of t, um, a simple abelian variety, then um, uh, look at the Colchin closure of its torsion. So. Uh, so a simple abelian variety over k of t. Let me just say not over k. Doesn't descend to k. Uh, and let h be the Colchin closure, smallest Colchin closed set of the torsion of it. Then this has been studied um, by Buyum and um, uh, uh, Wachowski in their proofs of function field model Lang, for example, a lot is known about these things. In particular, H is a, H is a strongly minimal <coughs> modular group. So if I let Q be the type of G over T, then this type is actually orthogonal to the constants. And if I look at the type, on the other hand, of T over K, so this is over K and T, if, on the other hand, I look at the type of, so I have G over T, A, remember, is the pair GT. So I look at G over T and T over K. This isn't orthogonal. It satisfies the equation delta X equals 1, but it's weakly orthogonal. And so this gives me that P is weakly orthogonal. And um, <coughs> um, on the other hand, uh, Q is not isolated because it's a strongly minimal type. So isolation would just say that the strongly minimal set has only finitely many algebraic points. But every torsion point of the abelian variety is an algebraic point over kt. And there's infinite torsion on the abelian variety. And so I get, uh, I get infinite torsion. And so I get that q is not isolated. And that implies p is not isolated. So I'm just recalling or sketching how to get from the Mannian kernel to, uh, to an example of a type over the constants, which is weakly orthogonal, but um, not isolated. Yes, this is not the only example, right? So the, 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 the J function equation that uh, Freitag and uh, Scanlon um, study also gives rise to an example. So there are other ways, but I, I think, I'm not sure, but we didn't know about, we didn't know that the Freitag Scanlon example was an example until after. So this was done about four years ago or something. Um, <clears throat> but there is another, there is, you can produce it also using, uh, using the J function. Um, OK, um, so what's my point? It's that the problem was Q, right? So the problem, the problem was this existence of this Q. It's a type which is um, minim a minimal type, which is not isolated um, and is weakly orthogonal. In fact, in this case, orthogonal to the constants. And it's very related to P. I think I can erase this now. Uh, it's, uh, it's part of P. P was the type of G comma T. And uh, Q was a type of G over T. So. Um, so you might think, well, <coughs> you somehow rule out these examples. So let's consider instead the following condition. The following condition on a type, S of k. Namely, um, if you take any realization of p, and any, so I'm reusing this, but I'm not in the example anymore. So I'm just taking any element. I'm using these, reusing these letters because they're suggestive of the example. Anything in the algebraic closure of k with a, and any type over not just k, but k together with this new element, which is uh, minimal. So q here is minimal and not isolated. Then let's ask that uh, a is weakly orthogonal to Q. A is independent of any realizations of Q, any finite set of realizations of Q, over not just little k, but, um, but with this additional, it only makes sense, of course, with this additional t, because Q is over kt. A is A. A in the counterexample A, is, it's a pair gt. And so t is in the algebraic closure of A. In fact, it's in the definable closure of A in that example. 
So A is my, so my type there was the type of A, where A was the pair GT. And here I'm, okay, I'm not, I'm not in this example. This is a, I'm, I'm trying to write this generally. So you take, take your type, consider this property. Now if, if you took T to be the empty set, and you took Q to be the generic type of the constants, then this is just saying that P is weakly orthogonal to the constants. That instance of star just says that P is weakly orthogonal to the constants. But in the counter, so that, that case of star is satisfied by the example. P was weakly orthogonal to the constants. But there was another case that failed, namely when T was as it is in the example. You had some relationship between a minimal non-isolated type, namely this Q. And so you might ask, um, <coughs> Maybe that was the problem, that you have to look at all the conditions star. Yeah, it's okay. This is an example, and the example ends here. And now, now Q is any. So this is if uh, for any. Any this, any T, and any Q. So take a realization of P, take a parameter which is in the algebraic closure of that realization, and now take any minimal non-isolated type over K together with that T, and ask that, that your original type over kt is, is weakly orthogonal to q. So just ruling out such q, for example. Well, not only such q, but uh, yeah. No, in that, well, so you, so in that, no, in that example, the q is not the constant. It's exactly g over t. The constant is over k. This q is over k together with some additional parameter, t. I think it's right, but uh, the way I, 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 yeah. So if you take this condition star as a general condition, forget about the example, you take this condition star, but you only look at the cases where t is the empty set and, and um, q is generic type of the constants, if you take that case, then you're just saying that p is weakly orthogonal to q. But if you take t as I did in the example and q as I did in the example, then you get something where this fails. So star fails in the example. And so maybe, replace weakly orthogonal to the constants by star. <coughs> but in fact, star makes sense abstractly. I mean, there's nothing in star about differentially closed fields. Right? So now, just work in a general setting. So I'm going to take a complete, totally transcendental theory. <coughs> so I'll just be two, three minutes. Uh, Finish off, right? Uh, complete, totally transcendental theory. Uh, K a saturated model of T, and little k any set of parameters. So I'm using still the same letters, but they're no longer fields. I'm not in differentially closed fields. I'm in an abstract setting. Totally transcendental theory, a saturated model, some parameters. I have some finite rank type. So the question is: Does star is star? equivalent to P being isolated. Yeah, you rank one. It's not? Okay. So I actually don't know the answer to this in this generality. So that's that, because this is, this is what we ask in the paper, so I'd be happy to, but uh, just, I'll just finish this off and then maybe you can see what, uh, why, why that's too ambitious, if it is. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm not in differentially closed fields at all anymore. And uh, so the theorem is I need one additional assumption. So this is the thing that was in four, Omar and I. <clears throat> Assume, moreover, that you know what the non-modular, non-locally modular minimal types look like in the theory. So in, the th in, the th in practice, we're in context where the Zilbert trichotomy holds, and we know a lot about the non-modular minimals. So I'm going to assume something about what the non-locally modular minimals look like. So assume that if a type is, let me write, non-orthogonal to a non-modular minimal, then it's non-orthogonal to some non-isolated type minimal type over the empty set. So of course everything had parameters here. My type could have parameters. I'm non-orthogonal to some other type with parameters that is, uh, that is non-modular and minimal. Then I should be able to find a type which is not isolated that's over the empty set that I'm non-orthogonal to. Empty set is not so important here. You could fix any set of parameters. 
but then they all have to work with that set of parameters. So this is true in uh, DCF, because the only non-modular minerals come from the generic type of the constants, which is a non-isolated type over the empty set. It's true also in compact complex manifolds, where everything comes from the projective line, which is a non-isolated type that is also over the empty set. So in the two examples that I was particularly interested in, DCF and CCM, this holds, and then the answer is yes. <coughs> to this question. Then star is equivalent to being isolated. Um, <coughs> so let me end with a, uh, so let me just write down, so this is, this assumption is true in DCF0 and CCM. And in general, I mean, so the question is when you don't have a Zilber trichotomy, what's, this is in some sense weaker than the trichotomy, right? I'm just asking that it's, I'm, already, I'm just asking that, the, I'm asking about what the non-modular minimals look like, but I'm only asking that they come from non-isolated types over the empty set. I'm not asking for a field or anything. Um, so just a, just a couple of comments to end. First of all, it, it seems hard to improve star. So for example, you can't replace ACL with DCL in star. There's an example actually coming from the Freitag Scanlon J function example where DCL, in, so it satisfies star with DCL, but it doesn't satisfy star with ACL. So you really need ACL there. Also, it'd be nice if the Qs could be assumed to be non-degenerate, uh, non-disintegrated in Remy, non-trivial. I think Remy called them disintegrated. Um, because in practice, those are those mysterious ones. So you could check star for the, for the, um, for the non-disintegrated ones, but for the, for the non-trivial types. But for the trivial types, we don't know what they look like. And there's examples where you can satisfy star with non-trivial things, but not satisfy with star with trivial things. So you really do need to know something about the trivial minimal types. And maybe my, my final comment is that one way of thinking of star is it's um, a reduction of understanding when a finite rank type is isolated to when a minimal type is isolated. So it's sort of in the spirit of this coordinatization. I'll stop there. Sorry for going over.